This sermon is from the series Fulfilled, How Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms Speak of Jesus. It was preached at Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope you enjoy. What is your favorite quote and why do you like it? I remember there was a time when I was reading like about three or four different authors and this quote from Martin Luther came up. It says, man is so curved in upon himself, talking about sinful man, that he uses not only physical but spiritual goods for his own purposes and in all things seeks only himself. And this image of a concave mirror of when we are so sinful, we're so in, in concave into ourselves that everything that comes in gets focused on ourselves either what we want or how we've been harmed. And it's an obscure quote, but it's stuck in my brain. Well, why do I begin with a line about quotes? Because I, we are going to look at our series, Fulfilled. As we said in Luke 24, Jesus said to his disciples that everything had to happen because it was fulfilled. And so we've been looking at a passage from Moses, the, the Pentateuch, from Genesis, we looked at a uh, prophecy last week, and today we're going to look at Psalm 110. Psalm 10 is the most quoted uh, Old Testament passage in all of the New Testament. Um, so obviously, the authors of the New Testament understood that there was something important about it that they quote it. I mean, just to give you an idea, some commentators think that it's probably been quoted directly or alluded to like over 20 times, and the author of Hebrew quotes one verse, Psalm 110 verse 4, five times in his book, five times. And so it's highly quotable, and it is it has an important text. It actually should look familiar because the very beginning of it, we actually read and had Jesus comment on it. Um, in the like Luke 20 or something like that. And so today we're, gonna, we're going to look at that and see how Psalm 100 point and 10 points to Jesus and the work that he's going to accomplish. So if you want to turn with me into your Bibles, Psalm 110, we'll read through all seven verses. The Lord says to my Lord, now before we do that, I want you to just notice in every Bible is different in every translation, but the way that the NIV does it is the Lord in all capitals is a word Yahweh, which is a title that means the God, the creator God, the God that they worship. And so anytime that is used, that is a name that the Jewish folks of their day would not even pronounce because they held it in such high esteem. And that is why the Lord in all capitals um, refers to the word Yahweh. And so I want you to note that the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troop will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning's womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from the brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. Now, before we dig into the text, there's a couple of the basics of the psalm that I think we need to point out that are important. And the first one is one that I didn't even read, It is, but it should be in your Bibles, and that is Psalm 110, a Psalm of David. And it's important for us to realize that this is a Psalm of David because this is actually something that Jesus highlights when he speaks about this passage. It's broken down into two different sections that complain, contain two different declarations from Yahweh the Lord in all capital letters, to a messianic figure. And so we will see that what he declares are that two things are going to happen in this messianic figure, and we will see that Jesus actually um, fulfills these things, that God is faithful to his promises. And the first thing that we want to note is that Jesus points out that David refers to the Messiah as his Lord, not his son. Now, I'm going to go over this a little bit quickly because we looked at this a few, like a month ago. But in Luke 20, Jesus makes this big deal about the Messiah is going to be the son of David. But yet he says to the Pharisees, 
who are questioning him that the Lord is not just going to be a, or the Messiah is not just going to be a descendant of David, but rather his Lord. That is why Yahweh says to the, David's Lord, he is recounting a conversation that he hears Yahweh having to this messianic figure. And so what Jesus is pointing out here is that if David was just referring to somebody who was his descendant, his son, he would have said that. He would have said, the Lord said to my son, my relative, my descendant, my seed. There's all kinds of biblical terms he could. But the fact that he uses the word um, Lord, Jesus implies that this messianic figure is going to be greater than David and even implies that he's going to be divine. And so what you will see is, is that ex- is exactly the, one of the points that I'm making in my outline. One of the declarations that Jesus makes is that this, or that David makes, is that this Messiah is going to be a divine king. Now, how do we know this? Well, one, Jesus, as Jesus pointed out in Luke 20 and in Matthew and in Mark, they all recount the same thing. So obviously the disciples who helped shape the gospels, all this passage of Psalm 110 sunk deep into their their minds. They knew that when Jesus taught this and made that point that he was proving that he was the Messiah, that he was the divine. That's why John says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then we see that Jesus is the one who fulfilled this. And so we see here in this text with just the way that David talks about his descendant and refers to him as Lord and not his descendant, that he has this divine Messiah in mind. But also it's the way that he talks about this Messiah that we know that he is going to be this divine king. The first thing is, is it says that the Messiah will sit at the right hand of God. Right there it says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, this is a very, very important piece of text here because this would have been a huge thing. You don't just walk into the presence of God. The the Jewish people were well aware of their own brokenness and their own sinfulness and the separation that they had. And so they had this longing. That's why for this. That's why they had the whole sacrificial system to remind them of their brokenness before the Lord. And there was a temple, and in the temple there was a building that had the holy place, and only the priest could go there after the sacrifices, and only one priest could go into the holy of holies that represented the throne room of God. And what David says is that this divine figure is going to walk right into this this throne room of God and sit at the right hand of him. And so it implies that one, he's divine, but two, that there's a perfection about him. And so in here is a huge and important statement. In the ancient world, to sit at a person's right hand was to occupy the place of honor It was the way that you knew that you were important. And so for a human figure to come into the presence of God and then just to sit right there is a powerful, powerful statement. This is a text that's quoted not only in three of the Gospels, but it's alluded to in all kinds of letters of Jesus coming and sitting in power at the right hand of God. I mean, I could rattle them all off. I won't, but there are a ton of places that this psalm 110 verse 1 are alluded to. Now, it's clear that the Messiah will not just sit there. The, the declaration goes a little bit further. He adds a little bit more of a description in what's going to happen. The Messiah will rule with God until his enemies are defeated. If you reread it, it says that the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The image that you need to have here is that the people are so vanished that he's just putting his feet on top of them because they are that humiliated and that defeated. And he says that that the Messiah figure will come into the presence of God and he will be there until all his enemies are defeated. And not only that, is it says that he will co-rule with the Lord. He will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, that's the throne room of God, the dwelling place of God, and he will say, here is your mighty scepter. So there is a sharing of their divine authority. And he says that you will rule in the midst of your enemies. 
what we see here is that what's going to happen is exactly what we saw happen in the gospel. And that is what, that Jesus will ascend into heaven and he is in the throne room of God and he is there ruling. He is ruling there until he comes back again and takes, eradicates all the enemies. That's what that line, rule in the midst of your enemies, means right now. That yes, God is reigning and he is supreme, but yet evil is still at work. But that evil will not be at work throughout in the, for all eternity. There will be an end to it. And so we can have a hope there. This is what Peter taught in his Christ's ascension. He says this passage in Acts. Acts 2, right there, he says, God has raised just Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and poured out what you know and see and hear. This is at Pentecost. He said, for David did not ascend to heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And so it's absolutely clear that this psalm is all about Jesus and his ascension and his reigning right now. And so this gives us hope that Jesus is currently ruling over our world. This is the hope of Psalm 110 and the hope that we long for. That yes, we celebrate today the coming of Jesus as a baby, but Advent also reminds us of a greater coming that the work of Jesus is not completely finished, that he will come again and he will eradicate evil. And it also gives us hope, though, here today, that nothing can happen outside of God's plan. I know that this raises all kinds of questions and I, I, we don't have time to look into it, but, but what I want us to see is that ultimately there is a hope that even though we may not understand why evil happens to us or in the world around us, that, that And we saw in even two weeks ago that there is a definite evil presence at work in our world. Satan and his enemies are at work trying to destroy things. But we also know that God's plan is greater and that he will eventually overcome this evil and eradicate it. And that can give us hope. That can give us hope. But also, it should also make us think about this. Because if Jesus is Lord, we have a question. We can either willingly submit to his lordship, or the language that is used is we can be defeated by it later. And so the question we need to ask ourselves today is, how am I willfully submitting to his lordship? It starts, it starts with us admitting our brokenness and putting our hope and trust in Jesus as our savior, as the Messiah that we've been longing for but it also is allowing him to control more and more of our lives, allowing him to call the shots, allowing him to tell us how we should live and shouldn't live. It's allowing him to have more of an impact of our lives. And so to remind us that we serve a divine king, a great king who's Lord over everything should make us feel a little bit small and it should humble us. And that's a good place for us to be to think about the grandness of who God is and how great and mighty he is helps us see that when he says that he, was, that he will come again and eradicate evil, that he will be faithful to that promise and he will do what he said he will do. But it should warn us that we need to submit to his lordship now as well. And so we can do that in humble obedience to him. Now, that would have been all great because most of the people of Israel expected that there would be a Messiah figure who was going to come and reign. Now, they assumed that he was just going to reign in Jerusalem and that he would sit on the throne of God there. But the psalmist takes a pretty big twist here. And that is, he says in the very next declaration of Yahweh, the Lord, not only that the king will be ascend and come into his presence, but that he will play an unexpected role and that role is a priestly role. Psalm 110 verse 4 says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now to unpack this a little bit, what we have to see is that throughout Israel's history, kings and priests were distinct individuals. Kings ruled. They were all about power and might, and they descended, most of them, they were supposed to come from the line of David, although Israel messed that up. They were supposed to come from Judah, 
and they were supposed to do kingly things about power and might. And then there, there were the priests who were from the line of Aaron who made the sacrifices on behalf of God's people. They admitted the people's brokenness and they would come in the presence of God pleading for his grace and his mercy. And so the kings were the people who were all about power and showing off might. And the priests were all about humble and humility and asking God for mercy and compassion. And they did all the sacrifices to remind the people and themselves of their brokenness before the Lord. And it didn't seem like those two things go together. I mean, you're either power or you're humble. You're either all about dominion and strength or you admit your brokenness and you plead on behalf of the people. And what we see is, though, that this is exactly who the psalmist David says this Messiah figure is going to be. He is going to be strong and mighty. He's going to be a divide king, but yet he is going to be a priest for his people. And now he refers to a obscure character who literally makes it in like two verses of the Bible. In Genesis 14, 18 through 20, Abraham met this figure named Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest. That's what it says. Then Melchizedek, a king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, and he was a priest of the God Most High. And he blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. And then God, Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now this is after Abraham had just rescued Lot and was being pursued. And here this figure comes, who is the king of Salem and a priest, and David bows down to him. And he er, acknowledges him and his greatness with, with the, giving him a tithe. But this person produces this huge blessing, and that's all there is about him. Until you get to Psalm 110 and then Hebrews, which quotes this verse like five times. But what we see here is that this is a figure who brought both of those things together, a kingly reign and the priestly role of an intermediary. Now, his name, interestingly, Melchizedek, means the king of righteousness. And he pronounced this blessing and a deliverance from his enemies to Abraham. Now, there are all kinds of ideas of people who think they know who Melchizedek is and they read a bunch of different things into it. I think you just need to take scripture at its word. He was the king of Salem, which is a precursor to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Salem, and so he is also a righteous person, and he is a king and a priest, and he is not from the line of Aaron, and so he's different. And so David says that this new kingly figure, this divine king, is also going to be a high priest and petition God for the sake of his people, to show compassion and mercy and He's going to be both of those things, just as Melchizedek was in Genesis. And what that means is that the Messiah will be an eternal priest. I mean, that's the language of Psalm 110, verse 4. You are a priest forever. The Lord has sworn it and will not change his mind. And so what we see here is that Jesus is the better Melchizedek, that Melchizedek foreshadowed the work of the Messiah, He was a king, and he was a priest. And even though that job was separated throughout all of Israel's history, it showed that these two things could come together. And of course, we know that those things come together in Jesus. We've already seen how um, Peter quoted Psalm 110, and Paul quote verse 1, and Paul quotes it as well. And the author of Hebrew, as I said, quotes it five different times and makes it clear that Jesus is the ultimate high priest and he is greater than Melchizedek. Now what this means, and we can see this, the argument that the author of Hebrews makes is that Jesus' sacrifice is the source of salvation for all who believe in him. He quotes this verse twice in Hebrews 5. But he has a line in here that he says he has become the eternal source of salvation for all who obey him 
and was designated by God to be a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And the job of the high priest, as I said, was for them to, to do the sacrifices, to, to admit the brokenness before the Lord, but to perform this act of sacrifice to show that there needed to be something done to fix the brokenness of the people so they could come into the presence of a holy God. And what Scripture tells us is that that is exactly what Jesus did. That when he died on the cross and cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken he, me? He became the eternal sacrifice once and for all, for all our sins. So the whole Jewish tabernacle and temple system of bringing these sacrifices daily and yearly and all this is eradicated. It's no longer needed because the greater sacrifice has, ca- has happened. And now you and I can put our hope and trust in Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice and the source of salvation for those who believe in us. So that's how he plays the high priestly role. But the the author of Hebrews continues in Hebrews 6 and says that not only is Jesus our sacrifice, and in that way he fulfills kind of the role of the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, he's also in God's presence mediating on our behalf. He says, for we have this hope as an anchor, and I love that word, the anchor for our soul, firm and secure. It enters into the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. As I said, that's the language of the temple where only in the presence of God could one priest go once a year after doing all kinds of sacrifices. And that temple was torn, that curtain was torn when Jesus died from the top to the bottom, showing that now you and I can come into the presence of God not out of fear or out of worry that maybe we aren't good enough, but rather out of the security of what Christ has done. And Jesus has entered into that sanctuary. He sits at the right hand of God, is what we saw in Psalm 110, so that our forerunner Jesus has entered on our behalf and he has become the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And if you remember, what we looked at when we talked about the ascension is that one of the roles that Jesus plays is that he is mediating, he is intercessing on our behalf. And so he is constantly praying for us and reminding God of his, the grace and the compassion that's available to us because of the work on the cross. And so we don't have to worry about coming into the presence of God because we know that the one who can speak on our behalf is sitting right there mediating on our behalf. And so we can have security with God. We can have an anchor in our soul. And the other thing that the author of Hebrews highlights is that this work is eternal and will never end. You know, the priests would come and they would go. They would do the sacrifices and they would be done. And there was not a permanency about it. There was a continual process about it. But what Hebrews says is that he is greater than everything that happened because it's eternal once and for all and it will never end. And he quotes this verse again. Because of this oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing the office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. And once that means is that the sacrifice that Jesus made is once and for all. I remember talking to somebody, a number of, this is before even Crossway, when I was a youth pastor. They had a fear. They had a fear in them because they felt like if they didn't actually confess their sins to the Lord, that God would never cover them. It was like the sacrifice of Jesus wasn't good enough unless they actually communicated those sins and were confessed those sins. And if in, in the confession part, then they would, they would actually get forgiveness. And if they didn't, they had a fear that they would literally, if they would die and not confess some sins that they knew about, that they, they would not get to spend all eternity with God. This passage counteracts that. It says that the mediation has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with Jesus and the work of his work on the cross of providing a salvation and his complete in, inner, uh, intercession for us. Now, we have to put our hope and trust in him. So I guess in that sense, there's our part in it. But we don't have to have a fear because Jesus is always at work. He's always at work. His sacrifice was good and he's always at work in the presence of God interceding on our behalf. And so we can have a security. We can have a confidence 
that we know that when we die or when Christ comes again, we will come into the presence of God. And so this passage, this Psalm 110, gives us clarity that we can have a confidence because Jesus' mediation is complete. That's why this passage is quoted so many times, because it crosses about Christ's, Christ's uh, divine rule, but it also talks about his sacrifice, his mediation, his intercession. But there's one other part about this psalm that it needs to end, and for us as we sit here in Advent, the waiting of Jesus is coming back again, we can wonder. I mean, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus came. Is, is God going to be faithful to his promises or not? Well, we saw in this text that God is faithful. When he says something is going to happen, it's going to happen. And he said that Jesus was going to come and he was going to mediate and he was going to rule in God's throne until the enemies are made on a footstool and completely defeated. And so the psalm ends with the declaration that the Messiah's final victory will come. He says, the Lord is at your right hand and he will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink a brook along the way and so lift up his head high. And what it means is that you and I await the triumph over his enemies and that this tr ultimate triumph will be realized. And so when we sit in our world today and we suffer the effects of evil, we see the brokenness in our relationships. We see everything that's going on around us and we wonder, is God at work? We can have hope that God is at work because he said he will bring what he said to completion. But even it, though it doesn't feel like maybe he is reigning, he is reigning and he is interceding. But when God says he will come, he came in the person of Jesus. And when he says he's coming back again, he will do what he said because he is faithful. And so, we know that evil will be defeated and, and Jesus will come back. He will extend his wrath on those who do not put their hope and trust in him and eradicate all of evil. And there will be a judgment. But as we said, we don't have to fear it because we have, stand in the confidence of Jesus. But that gives us hope because he will partake in the sweet taste of victory. The image that he uses is a drink from a brook along the way so he will lift his head high. And most commentators actually think that he's referring to using an image that happened in the story of Samson and Judges, where Samson eradicates all these Philistines and he complains about how thirsty he is and all of a sudden this brook comes up and he drinks and it talks about him lifting his head, being refreshed. And most commentators think that this is the imagery that the psalmist David is using here, that when Jesus comes, and when evil is eradicated, he will lift his head high in victory because he'll see the world as we will get to see it without any of the effects of sin and evil and his triumph will be complete. And so you and I can look forward to that day. Now I know sometimes for us as we sit in our world today, it doesn't seem like much hope, but I don't know about you, but just knowing that there could be an end to the stuff that's happening can often bring hope and peace. And so what we see in our text is that God was faithful. And even though it took hundreds of years before this, and thousands of years probably from when this prophecy was made, God was faithful and he brought Jesus as a baby that we celebrate here at Christmas. He is also faithful. And even though it's been thousands of years since Christ came again, Christ will come and he will bring that victory. And we can have hope because he is reigning in heaven and he has provided us a source of salvation. And so today, even in the midst of the darkness, we know that his light will come and he will bring the new heavens and the new earth and that can give us hope and that can give us an anticipation as we wait his second coming. So the question that we have is, are we willing to submit ourselves to the lordship of Jesus by trusting his sacrifice? And do we trust that he is faithful and what he said will happen? And do we allow it to gravitate and to have a control whole of our hearts that we don't let the things of this world weigh us down as much because we know that Jesus is faithful and he will bring better days? 
may this psalm and this truth that it speaks lighten our loads because we know that God is faithful and he will do what he promised. He is at work as the divine king in the presence of God, interceding on our behalf, and he will come again to make all things new. That is where our hope is found. Let's pray. You have just watched a sermon from Crossway Church in Battleground, Washington. We hope that you enjoyed it, and we'd love to have you come join us for a worship service on Sunday at 10 a.m. at 311 North Parkway Avenue in Battleground, Washington. If you'd like to find more information about us online, you can find it at crosswaychurchwa.com.